Like I said, we're continuing our, um, our series called Old School, and what we've done all summer long is just kind of journey our way through the Old Testament. We're just kind of hitting some of the highlights from the Old Testament, talking about various stories of people uh, as they, they've just kind of walked with God's people, the Israelites, through their experiences. And, and what we want you to see in this, and, and the reason that we've done this all summer is because we want you to see everything has always pointed to Jesus. That's what it's all about. No matter what happens with God's people, no matter what happens in history, like from the moment God said, let there be light, everything has always just pointed to Jesus. He is what it's all about. Even thousands of years before he was born, it's all about him. And so we wanted you to see that. We talked about that in a variety of ways. And I'll be honest with you, a lot of the sermons like through this series have been inspiring or, you know, like just really motivational. But today, uh, today is almost like a cautionary tale. Today's almost like a warning to some of us about what it might look like if we choose not to say, all right, God, I'm going to live in cooperation with you, but instead to say, I'm going to do my own thing. This might be a warning to some of you this morning. We're going to look at the story of a man named Samson and at some of his experiences in his life. And I'm sure that name is familiar to you. And if it's not, you'll learn more about him this morning. So again, we're in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is set about a thousand years before Jesus was born. And what kind of happens? It's one of my favorite books. It's very fascinating. A lot of crazy, weird stuff happens in the book of Judges. I wish we had time to talk about this morning. But what happens with the Israelites, with God's people, is they kind of go through this pattern of behavior where for a while they do everything right, but then they start to do the way the Bible says they start to do what's right in their own eyes. In other words, not so much what God says, but more what they want to do. And so they go on that way for a while, and then they start to suffer the consequences of their sinful actions. They start to kind of feel the burn a little bit, so to speak. And, and so eventually, you know, God lets that happen, and they get tired of it, and they go running back to him. And, and God, because he's different than you, because he's different than me, he's full of grace and, and love and mercy. God says, all right, I'm going to choose to rescue you. I'm going to deliver you over and over and over again. And for a period of time, he did that by using a series of people called judges, series of men and women called judges. These were people that God kind of raised up and said, all right, you're going to be like, kind of like the figurehead who's going to lead the people out of enslavement or, or captivity or whatever the case may be. So at this point in the story where Samson comes into the picture, the Philistines are the people who have been enslaving the Israelites for about 40 years. They're the people who are causing a lot of grief for God's people for about 40 years. Uh, and God finally says, you know what? It's time for me to do something about this. This can't go on this way any longer. So I'm going to raise up a judge who's going to deliver you. And his name is going to be Samson. That's where we start this morning. Now, many of you I've heard bits and pieces of this story. You're familiar again with his name. For a lot of you, when I say the name Samson, the next name that comes to mind is what? Delilah, right? Samson and Delilah. But what we're going to do this morning is we're going to look at a lot of the parts of Samson's story that, I'll just be honest, these are the parts that if you grew up going to Sunday school, they didn't make flannel graph pieces for these parts, okay? I grew up thinking Samson was a Bible hero, but we're going to learn the truth about Samson a little bit this morning and about what his life looked like. So let's start with this. Samson was a really unique individual. He was what was called a Nazarite. What that meant was uh, a Nazarite was someone who had taken a voluntary vow before God to do a few things. And God had commanded before Samson was ever born that he was to be a Nazarite from birth. And so Samson was a Nazarite for his entire life. Now, the Nazarite vow involved three different things. The first one was no alcohol, okay? And in fact, it was so strong that you couldn't eat grapes, you couldn't eat raisins, nothing that comes from a vineyard, nothing that grows on a vine. No alcohol whatsoever. The second thing was... You couldn't touch a dead body, whether it was a human, animal, nothing. And so it hit me for the first time this week that what that basically meant was, if you were a Nazarite, you had to be a vegetarian like your entire life. Okay, now I know that some of you are tracking with me this morning and you're like, okay, no beer and no steak, I'm out, right? Not interested in the Nazarite vow. The third element was this, and this is where it gets a little different, a little weird. The third thing was no haircuts. So imagine growing up in the Middle East in that climate and you can't cut your hair. That's not a lot of fun, okay? Now the purpose of the Nazarite vow was to be temporary. Often it would be a month or six months or even up to a year. And the point was to demonstrate your dedication to God. But nobody was ever a Nazarite for their entire life, ever. That's just crazy. Nobody ever did that except for Samson, okay? Now think about this. 
Imagine you're six or seven years old, you're out in the front yard, you're playing catch with your friends, and every time they throw the baseball to you, it's hitting you in the face because your hair's in your eyes and you can't see anything. And so you go inside and you're like, hey, mom, dad, can I get a haircut like every other kid in the neighborhood? And they're like, nope, you're a Nazarite, figure it out, right? Or imagine that you go to a wedding and everybody's enjoying the buffet, drinking champagne, having a good time, and you just kind of have to hang back and sit in the corner because you can't participate in any of that. That's Samson's life. And so it probably doesn't sound like a lot of fun. And I imagine Samson probably grew up resenting that a little bit because he, he just couldn't live the way that most other people lived because that was what God had determined for him before his birth that was going to be the case. Now, not only was that what God said, okay, Samson, this is how you're going to live. This is what your life's going to be like. But God also had a mission for Samson. And this is what the mission was. God said, no razor may be used on his head because the boy is to be a Nazarite set apart to God from birth and he will begin the deliverance of Israel from the hands of the Philistines. So his mission is a really big one. God says, Samson, you're gonna be at the center of my plan to deliver my people from the Philistines. Now, how's Samson gonna go about accomplishing that mission? That's the question. And the answer is he's not going to do it on his own strength. He's not going to do it from something that comes from within him, right? That would be impossible. He's just one man who's got to deliver an entire nation of people from captivity. The answer is he's going to do that using a strength that comes from outside of him. Check this verse out. It says, the spirit of the Lord began to stir him. The spirit of the Lord began to stir him. The word stir literally means to motivate to action, to motivate to action. But we see very quickly in Samson's story, it wasn't only the spirit of the Lord who motivated Samson to action. He was also motiv motivated to action by women, okay? The very first thing that we see Samson do in his life is he goes into a Philistine town, he goes into enemy territory, and he spots a woman who he thinks is very attractive. So he goes back to his house and he demands for his parents, hey, go get this woman, you know, whatever, she's smoking hot, I wanna marry, that's probably what the original Hebrew said, I wanna marry her, right? And so he tells him, go get her for me. But but, uh, and, and then what happens is parents kind of say, listen, we can't do that. Like we're commanded, we can't intermarry with the Philistines. It would just be a stupid thing to literally sleep with the enemy. We can't go get her for you. But here's what Samson says to them. And I want you to pay careful attention to this because it's right at the beginning of his story. But this is indicative of what his entire story looks like. And it's this sentence that he says to his parents about this woman. He tells them, get her for me for she is right in my eyes. In my eyes. Here's the first thing I want you to know from Samson's story is this. Giving into temptation always leads to sin. Giving into temptation always leads to sin. In other words, you see something, you know it's not, it's not right, it's not what you're supposed to do, it's not what God wants for you, it's not what God desires for you or is commanded for you, but you go for it anyway. Giving into that temptation is gonna lead you into sin every single time. Watch what happens as this develops in Samson's life. And remember as you do that pattern that the Israelites, remember we said like they would do what God wanted for a while, then they'd, they'd start to do their own thing, they'd suffer the consequences, go running back to God. And Samson is supposed to be different. Like he's supposed to kind of set the pace for a different way of doing things. He's supposed to live differently among his people, but we already see he's starting to do the same thing that they're doing. And now let's be honest for a second, because that's often the way that we operate too, isn't it? We know what we're supposed to do. We know what God wants for us or from us, but we'd rather do our own thing. We'd rather go about our own way of living, whatever the case may be. And we live under this illusion that that is the best way to go about life. And it's not until we learn the hard way that it's actually a terrible way to live, that our eyes are opened. Like a lot of us, Samson is about to learn that lesson the hard way. And so to fast forward in the story a little bit, the marriage to this woman that he's seen in this enemy village, they arranged the marriage, right? They're gonna have this big wedding feast that's gonna last for seven days. That was customary in that culture. And so Samson goes back into the Philistine town to make plans for the wedding. And on his way there, he walks through a vineyard. Now, it doesn't say that he drinks any wine, doesn't say he ate any grapes, doesn't say that there were, you know, none of that. But he's flirting with temptation. He's somewhere he, he doesn't have to be, shouldn't be there. He chooses to take a path that he doesn't have to take. And he's just beginning to flirt with the temptation a little bit, right? Because he's not supposed to be there. So as he's walking through the vineyard, he gets attacked by a lion. Here's what happens. It says, the spirit of the Lord came upon him in great power so that he tore the lion apart with his bare hands as one, I don't know what this, as one tears a young goat. Like that's normal, right? Like you 
tore one apart for your backyard barbecue the other night, right? Um, but apparently the way that you tear apart a young goat, because that's something you do in your day, um, that's how he tore apart a lion. It, the point is it was easy for him. It was easy for him. Now, if you study Samson's life, there are 10 supernatural feats or so that he accomplishes through what the Bible says is the power of the Spirit of the Lord. 10 supernatural feats. And I don't want you to miss that because, you know, we often don't pay attention to the fact that it's through God's power that he does these things. Let me tell you what I mean. When I was growing up, in my mind, when I would picture Samson, and maybe you're like me, whenever I would picture Samson in my mind, just because of the way that I was taught his story, I would always picture him like Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime. <laughs> right? That was Samson. Okay? Uh, that's how I pictured a big ripped guy, right? You know, muscular or whatever. I was pictured, you know, he's strong. I knew God gave him his strength. They, that was the first thing he told you in Sunday school, right? His strength was from God. But that's how I pictured Samson. But let me ask you a question. Let me ask you a question. What puts on display more that it's God's power working in Samson that allows him to do these things? What, what displays that more? If, if Samson looks like this or if he looks like, I don't know, Barney Fife? <laughs> right? What puts on display more that it's not his own strength that's doing these things, but if he looks like this? I mean, people would look at this guy and be like, you didn't kill a lion. In fact, the goat would have torn you apart. You know what I'm saying? Like, it is not your strength that's enabling you to do these things. It's some other strength. It's got to be something else. Often that is how God works in our lives. He works in such a way that people can't point at you and go, you did this. Or people can't point at you and go, this came from you. Often God works in our lives in such a way that the only possible explanation is God did this in your life. That's how he works, and that's how he works in Samson's life, okay? So picture Samson this way from now on, all right? I'm going to take that off the screen because that's weird. So anyway, he heads back into, into town, right? He works out the details of the wedding, uh, and then a few days later, he's on his way back, okay? And he, he travels through that same vineyard, and as he's traveling, he sees that lion that he killed a few days before, he sees the carcass laying there and at some point over the last few days, a swarm of bees has made a hive in there and there's some honey and Samson's hungry. And so he thinks, I'm, I'm going to eat this honey. Reaches inside the lion carcass, he takes the honey in, and he begins to eat it. Now, aside from the fact that that's gross, it's also against the Nazarite vow because not only has he touched the, the, remember, he's not allowed to touch a dead body, human or animal. Not only has he done that, but he's even eating something that came from within this carcass. So if you're keeping track, he's completely disregarded his vow by flirting with temptation and walking through a vineyard. And now here he is, he's, dis, he's disregarded his vow by touching this dead body, eating something that came from inside it. And Samson, who's been called to live distinctly and differently, he's clearly not interested. And his attitude is, I'm going to do whatever I want, whenever I want to. And what that means is, to put it in simple terms, he's a hypocrite. He looks one way on the outside, but when you see his actions and his attitude, he lives completely differently. And then let me ask you a question. How many of us have lived that way? I would say that probably any of us who claim to be a Christian could also claim to say, I've lived as a hypocrite at some point in my life. We've all done that. Right? So now it's time for the wedding and Samson heads back into the Philistine town and he gets 30 men assigned to him to be his groomsmen. Okay, that, and what that tells us is he wasn't a popular guy. He had no friends. They basically had to hire mercenary groomsmen to come and hang out with him at his wedding. But 30 guys that they assigned to him to be his groomsmen because he's a loner. He's isolated. He's on his own. Now, to make matters worse, Samson begins to antagonize these guys by making a bet with them. He says, hey, let's do this. I'm going to tell you a riddle, okay? And if you can't solve the riddle over the next seven days, over the course of the wedding feast, if you can't figure out this riddle, then, then you each, all 30 of you, have to buy me a new suit. You got to buy me a new set of clothes. But if you figure it out by the end of the wedding feast, then I will buy each of you a new set of clothes, right? And so they accept the bet, and he poses this riddle. He says, out of the eater, something to eat. Out of the strong, something sweet. And for three days, they couldn't give the answer. So he's making them look really stupid. He's making them look foolish. You know, they're going to be out some money. They don't like that. And they don't like Samson anyway. Remember, they were, they were assigned to be a part of his wedding. Uh, and so they decide they're going to try to manipulate the system a little bit. So they go to Samson's brand new wife and they say, listen, here's the deal. You figure out the answer to this riddle and tell us what it is before the end of the wedding feast or we're going to burn you and your father to death. Like there's a wedding present, right? 
Uh, we're going to burn you to death. And so she goes to Samson and she says, hey, listen, you're supposed to be telling me everything. I'm your new wife. Like you're supposed to be sharing everything with me. Like tell me the answer to this riddle. And he resists at first, but eventually he says, okay, here's the answer. And he tells her what it is. And kind of at the 11th hour, she goes to these men and they come to him on the seventh day at the end of the feast. And they say, uh, they say this, what is sweeter than honey? And what is stronger than a lion? And then Samson, uh, with his response, does not endear himself to any women anywhere. Look at what he says. He says to the men after they solve his riddle, if you had not plowed with my heifer, you would not have solved my riddle. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> He's not going to be a Bible hero in your mind after today, okay? If you thought he was not the case. Well, Samson's not a rich guy, and he knows he's about to have to buy all 30 of these men a new set of clothes, and he doesn't like that. And so watch what happens. This is his response. It says, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. He went down to Ashkelon, which is a Philistine town. He struck down 30 of their men, stripped them of everything, and gave their clothes to those who had explained the riddle. Burning with anger, he returned to his father's home, and Samson's wife was given to one of his companions who had attended him at his feast. The ESV translates says she was given to his best man. Now that's a weird wedding all the way around, just weird stuff happening. But what we learn about Samson through this process is he's angry and he's vengeful, okay? But here's what I don't want you to miss before we go any further. I don't want you to miss the fact that even though Samson seems to be choosing the wrong path at all times, he seems to be doing the wrong thing, making the wrong choice, doing what he's not supposed to do. Even though it seems like he's doing that at every turn, God is beginning to orchestrate things and he's beginning to put the pieces in place and he's beginning to make things happen and the wheels are starting to turn for his purpose to be accomplished in Samson, whether he ever cooperates or not. And that is how God will work in your life. And that is how God will work in my life. His purpose for you is going to get accomplished with you or without you. But what we're about to see in Samson's life is it's a whole lot easier and a whole lot better for you and me if we choose to cooperate, if we choose to say, all right, God, I will, I'll do things your way. So just kind of hang on to that, right? So a little while later, fast forward again, Samson is lonely. He's cooled down. He's not so angry anymore. And he decides he's going to go visit his wife. And actually, this was kind of normal in that culture when you would have somebody from one nation who would marry into another nation. The wife would continue to live at home and the husband would go and visit uh, and, and they would get to know each other. And that was a way of kind of like maintaining the political tensions and stuff like that. And so he goes to visit his wife. This is normal. But when he gets to town, his wife's father kind of meets him at the gate of the city and he says, listen, I thought you were really mad. I didn't think you wanted anything to do with her. And so I gave her to your best man. Well, Samson gets really angry at this. He's, he is super upset. It's the time of the wheat harvest in that town. And that had huge repercussions because they were an agricultural society. So the wheat harvest was a big deal. And so if you're Samson and you're upset because your father-in-law gave your wife to your best man and you want to get revenge, what is the logical thing that you do? Well, obviously you catch 300 foxes, right? Because that's what Samson did. It says he caught 300 foxes. I have no idea how. That's weird. It says he tied them tail to tail. I have no idea how. And I'll just tell you right now, if you're a member of PETA, earmuffs for a second because you're not going to like this, uh, but he set them on fire and he turned them loose in the wheat fields and they burned the fields of the Philistines to the ground. All right. So that sets off this chain of reactions. The Philistines go back and they do what they originally said they were going to do. And they burn Samson's wife and her father in their house while they're in it. Like they kill them. Okay. And then the Philistines say, well, we're just going to go to war with Israel over this. It's done. We're finished. And so they start lining up to fight. Then the Israelites realize what's happening. They see the Philistines lining up to fight. So they go to the Philistines and they say, what's the deal? Why are you lining up to fight? Why are we going to war here? And the Philistines tell them what Samson did. The Israelites are like, we don't like him either. You can have him, you know, they're, they're not sticking up for him. And so Samson actually brokers a deal with his own people where he says, if you turn me over to the Philistines, like I'll go peacefully, just promise me that you won't go to war against me yourselves. And so they tie Samson up, tie him to a rock and they leave him there. And the Philistines come and, and they, they capture him. Here's what happens next when the Philistines show up. Ready? It says, the spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon him. There's that phrase again, the spirit of the Lord. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Now, if you can get away from the weirdness of that, um, 
again, we see this emphasis on he's breaking his vow by touching a part of this dead animal, this dead body. If you look at Samson's life again, it's like he chooses to do the wrong thing that he's not supposed to do at all times. It's like he takes the wrong path at all times, but yet somehow he comes out smelling like roses. He comes out ahead. Have you ever known anybody like that? Who it seems like they do the wrong thing all the time. And maybe, you're, maybe you feel like you're trying to do the right thing and somebody else is doing the wrong thing, but yet you feel like you're suffering and they come out ahead every single time. You ever known somebody like that? You're about to see the danger of that. Okay, so let's keep going. I guess killing a thousand men makes you thirsty because the very next time we see, uh, the very next thing we see Samson do is he prays. And interestingly enough, this is the first time that we see Samson pray in his story. And it's in this moment after he's just had this huge fight with all these men, he kills a thousand men. He's so thirsty and he's so desperate that he cries out to God. And by the way, that probably ought to sound familiar to some of us too, because many of us just allow God to stay over on his side of the line and we continue to do our thing until we have a bad day or until we're desperate or until we need something. And then all of a sudden we wanna run to God or we wanna call on God or something like that. But when things are good, we just kinda let him do his thing. That's what Samson does, probably sounds familiar. This is what he says. It says, because he was very thirsty, he cried out to the Lord, you have given your servant this great victory. Must I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the Philistines? Then God opened up the hollow place in Lehi and water came out of it. When Samson drank, his strength returned and he revived. Now God's not like me, okay? And God's not like you. If it was me and Samson prayed in that moment, I would have been like, oh, you're thirsty. Figure it out, tough guy. This is the first time I've heard from you and that's all you have to say to me? I'm not helping you out. But God is different. God is full of mercy. He's full of grace. And, and so he chooses again to, to be merciful to Samson. And you would think this would be a turning point in Samson's life, right? God helps him out in this moment. And like from this point on, he obeyed God. You would think that would be the case. But the fact is, this kind of kicks off his 20 years of leadership over Israel as their judge and nothing changes. Nothing changes. Like I said earlier, maybe you grew up thinking there was just one woman in Samson's life. There are actually three that we know of. You've already heard about the one that he was married to. Um, we're about to meet the next one because the very next thing Samson does is he goes into this Philistine town called Gaza and he finds a prostitute. They did not have a flannel graph character for her when I was in Sunday school, okay? He goes and he finds this woman and he, and he spends the night with her. Well, the Philistines find out that he's there and they come up with this plan. They say, when he goes to leave in the morning, we're going to ambush him and we're going to take him out. We're going to kill him. Now, if you're tracking with me, it seems like even after God's bailed Samson out, he's, he's been kind to him, he's empowered him, he's enabled him, he's delivered him. Samson continues to believe that he's indestructible. Okay, he's so arrogant, he just believes he's bulletproof. He thinks he can do anything, he can get away with anything. It doesn't matter. He has so much strength Okay, but he has no wisdom and he has no self-control and no discipline. And that's a terribly lethal combination. And let me just say, men in the room, please hear this, okay? Men, listen to this. Strength, like having great strength without wisdom and without self-control will get people hurt. And usually it's the people that we're called to protect and provide for and love. Great strength without wisdom is a concoction for hurt to happen. And so we have to learn that relying on strength alone is not enough. We need to rely on the wisdom of God to help us understand how to use our strength, not to hurt people, but to help people. I hope you don't miss that. That's why Proverbs chapter 24 says, a wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. A wise man is full of strength and a man of knowledge enhances his might. In other words, wisdom and strength need to go together. We need to have both. And so Samson is with this prostitute, but only until midnight. This is what happens. It says, Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate together with the two posts and tore them loose bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Hebron. All right. Now, I, I don't think that he did that on his own strength. Okay, but here's the deal. You might notice something was missing in there because every other time he's done something that required the strength, where did it say the strength came from? The spirit of the Lord, right? And it wasn't in these verses. Now, again, I don't think he did this on his own strength, but I think what the Bible is doing is giving us a clue that some things are shifting in Samson's life. Some things are changing. And this is the second thing I want you to know from Samson's story. God will not let us escape the consequences of our sin. We've already said giving into temptation leads to sin. 
But God will not let us escape the consequences of that. See, God is patient and God is kind and he, he's loving, but he will not be mocked. God will not be mocked. He's not willing to let the people that love him continue to rebel against him over and over without letting us feel some of the consequences of our sinful actions. It just doesn't work that way. And we see how this plays out. We get to the, the famous part of the story, right? It says, sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. There's the name that most people know. So the Philistines immediately come to Delilah and they bribe her. They say, hey, we'll pay you a lot of money if you'll find out what his weakness is. If you can figure out how we can overcome him and defeat him, we will, we will make you a rich woman. And it actually says they didn't even want to kill him. They just wanted to humiliate him the way that he had humiliated them for so many years. And they also have a suspicion that they can turn Samson against his own people. See, they've been studying him this whole time. They've been studying Samson and they've learned something about him. And that's that he has no character. He has no discipline. He has no loyalty. He has no self-control. See, the, the truth is, just like Samson, we can pretend for a while. And we can make people think that we're one thing. But sooner or later, the truth is always found out and our true character always shines through. And so we need to be sure that our character is true because even our enemies will find our weaknesses and exploit them. So you got to be sure that you're a person of integrity, that your character is true. Samson thought that his strength was his get out of jail free card. He thought he could walk into any situation and walk out on the other side unscathed by relying on his own strength. He thought it was his way to get out of anything. And so what do you think your get out of jail free card is? What is it that you rely on to get you out of any situation no matter what, what comes your way? And I know I've already talked to the men in the room, but ladies don't miss this because it's not just about men. It could be anything. It could be your beauty. It could be your intelligence. It could be your influence or your power or your independence. Each one of us, we've got to get out of jail free card that if we're not careful, it becomes our natural defense mechanism. It becomes that thing we just naturally fall back on and we rely on that thing to get us out of those situations in our life where we know we've walked a little too far. So what is that thing for you? What's your get out of jail free card? Samson thought he could take huge risks and get away with it. And so when Delilah came to him and she said, hey, tell me the secret of your strength. What is it? Like, what's your weakness? Samson decides that he's gonna play this little game with her because he thinks he's indestructible. And so he tells her, if you take bowstrings that have never been used and tie my hands with them, I'll become like any other man. I'll become as weak as anyone else. And so she ties him up with the bowstrings when he falls asleep. And then she yells, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. She calls in the Philistines, right? But Samson just rips the bowstrings off and beats everybody up. And so she's humiliated by this. She feels like a fool. She tells Samson, I can't believe you lied to me. Tell me what the, the secret of your strength is. Be honest with me. And so he tells her, if you use new ropes, brand new ropes, and bind me up with them, then, you know, I'll be weak. And so she does. And she calls the Philistines in and he breaks out of them and beats everybody up. And then he's like, oh, if you take my hair and put it in this loom and tie it off into knots and everything, then I'll become weak like anyone else. And she does this and it doesn't work. She calls the Philistines in. He breaks out, beats everybody up, okay? And finally, she gets really angry with him. She presses on him again. This is what she says. How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third. Isn't it funny that she's questioning how much he loves her? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. Don't elbow your wives, guys. It's not a good time. Listen, from the outside looking in, this is totally insane. Samson, she is trying to kill you. Stop giving her clues, right? She continues to press and he continues to get closer and closer and closer with every clue that he gives her. But now let's look in the mirror. Is there a time in your life you can look in the rearview mirror? You can see back into your past and you see a time where now you're like, what was I thinking? You're like, I don't know why. Why was I with him? Why was I with her? Why did I go there? Why did I do that? Why did I act that way? Why did I treat them that way? Like you can look back now and like they say, hindsight is 2020. But at the time you didn't see it because you were doing what was right in your eyes. That's where Samson finds himself. And we've all been there. We've all been there. Okay. When we do what's right in our own guys, it's like they say, in our own eyes, it's like they say, you play with fire long enough, you're going to get burned. And so let me ask you a question. If God were loving what would he do? Would he allow us to continue to play with matches until we get burned, to continue to rebel, to continue to live our way? Or like a loving, good father, 
Would he allow us to feel some of the consequences? And, and honestly, this is the part of God's grace we don't like. I mean, we talk about God's grace. This is the part we don't want to talk about. But every bit of this is God's grace. When he allows us to begin to feel the consequences of our sinful actions because he knows we're playing with fire and he knows sooner or later it's going to burn us. And so we begin to feel some of those consequences and we want to blame God for it. But the truth is he does it because he loves us. Every parent in the room understands that, right? Because you can't let your kids get away with everything Sooner or later, you know, you can't bail them out. You got to let them feel some of the consequences or they'll never grow up. They'll never mature and they'll never change. And that's how God is with us. And so here's what he does. Here's what Samson does. It says, he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head, he said, because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave me and I would become as weak as any other man. This is the only line Samson has never crossed with God. It's his final rebellion. He has disregarded every other part of his vow except for this one. The one thing he swore he'd never do and he finds himself doing it. You ever been there? The one thing you swore you'd never do and you find yourself doing it and you're frustrated with yourself or whatever. Samson's power wasn't in his hair. His power came from God and at every other moment in his life, he got away with it. Every other vow he broke, you know, every other reckless thing he did, he, he came out seemingly unscathed. And Samson thinks this is gonna be the same as every other time. Says when Delilah saw that he had told her everything, she sent word to the rulers of the Philistines, come back once more, he's told me everything. So the rulers of the Philistines returned with the silver in their hands. After putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off the seven braids of his hair and so began to subdue him and his strength left him. Then she called, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. He awoke from his sleep and thought, I will go out as before and shake myself free. Like I said, he thinks it's gonna be like every other time and listen to me. Often that's how it works with your get out of jail free card. Often you can do that thing that you wanna do over and over and over and it'll work until one day it doesn't. And in this moment, it doesn't work anymore. It says, he didn't know that the Lord had left him. Then the Philistines seized him, gouged out his eyes, that's gross, and took him down to Gaza. Binding him with bronze shackles, they set him to grinding grain in the prison. This is a familiar story to many of us. It's the story of many people. Listen, being good at being bad is not a good thing. Being good at being bad is not a blessing. And Samson started to believe this delusional thought that, that he could get away with anything. And it, like I said, it worked every single time until eventually it didn't. And in this moment, God said, enough. Enough, not this time. For some of us, like I said earlier, today is a warning because God will at some point say enough and he'll let us feel the consequences of our actions, which means, by the way, that God loves you. That means that you matter to him. That means that he wants your life to be good. Every parent, like I said, knows how that works. And so let me ask you this question. What will it take for you to come to your senses? What is it gonna take for your heart to change? For Samson, it got brutal. He found himself blind, which is interesting because it was his eyes that always got him into trouble in the first place. He finds himself a slave doing the job of an animal, which is funny because he was always a slave to his reckless impulses up to this point, long before he was a slave to the Philistines. You ever feel that way, by the way, like you're a slave to your own reckless impulses or destructive behavior? Look how it plays out. It goes on and it says, but the hair on his head began to grow again after it had been shaved. A little tension starts to build here, okay? Now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw him, they praised their God saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands, the one who laid waste to our land and multiplied our slain. While they were high in spirits, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of the prison and he performed for them. When they stood him among the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so that I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please God, strengthen me just once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. Remember the first time we see Samson pray? He prayed the selfish prayer because he was thirsty. The second time we see Samson pray, he's praying for revenge for his two eyes. What does that tell us about Samson's character? 
It goes on, then Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on one and his left hand on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it, including Samson, by the way. Thus he killed many more when he died than while he lived. So based on that, let me ask you this question as we start to wind down here. Do you think he ever got it? You think he ever got it? Because I sure don't. I mean, God still accomplished his purpose through Samson. Uh, he still gets that done. Samson did a lot of damage to the Philistines. And God's purpose was still accomplished. But he ended up with a horrible life, with a terrible ending. And at no point do we ever see Samson think about anyone but himself. In his last breath, all he's thinking about is himself getting revenge, right? I grew up thinking Samson was a hero. Man, he's not. He's a tragedy. He's a tragedy. What was the mission of his life? To deliver the Israelites, right? And his mission was still accomplished, but not because of Samson. It was accomplished in spite of him. And I want you to know this morning that God's purpose for your life is going to be accomplished, but it's either going to be accomplished with you or in spite of you. And here's the reality, okay? You can't throw God a curveball. You can't do something that God steps back from and he scratches his head and he goes, well, I didn't see that coming. I don't know what to do. I'm not sure how to handle this situation. You can't do that. And I take comfort in that fact that that's never gonna happen. But what can happen is we can strike out. In other words, we can waste our lives. Our disobedience does not affect God's ability to accomplish his purpose one single bit, but it can affect our quality of life. It will. God has a distinctive way of living for you, just like he did for Samson. He has a purpose for you, just like he did for Samson. And Samson rebelled against both of those things. And so this comes back to one of those fundamental questions that we ask around here all the time, and it's this. Do you really believe that what God has for you in your life is good? And do you really believe that God's intentions toward you are good? And do you really believe that when God points you toward a certain way of living or towards a certain mission in your life, that what he wants is what's best for you? Or do you say, you know what, God, I'm good. I'm going to do things my way. I'm going to do what I want when I want, because that's what Samson did. And his life was marked by three things that we see very clearly in his story. The first one is he lived in isolation. We get no mention of Samson ever living in any kind of authentic or real relationship with anyone. He lived in isolation at all times. And if that's the way that you live, you're setting yourself up for disaster. We see that he lived selfishly. It was always about him and no one else. He used everyone around him for his own purposes. It was all about what he wanted, okay? And we see that he lived recklessly. He took stupid chances. He took unnecessary risks. And that's his snapshot. Isolated, selfish, and reckless. And now put all that aside for a second and think about this. What could Samson's life have looked like if he had just lived in cooperation with God? What could have been accomplished? How much better could it have been? I don't know what marks your life. I don't know if it sounds like that, isolated, selfish, reckless. Maybe it sounds nothing like that. Maybe it's nothing like Samson, but I want you to do this. Imagine your life in total cooperation with God. What could it look like? What could you do? And do you think the trajectory that your life is on or the potential outcome of your life could be different or could be better if you would just surrender and live in cooperation with him? If you would just believe that he is a good father who wants to give good gifts to his children because he loves us. If you do believe that, then that means you've got to rethink some things. I think you've got to ask some questions. You've got to ask questions like this. Who are you living with? Are you living in community with people or are you living isolated from people? Do you have a support network? Do you have people around you to encourage you? Who are you living with? How about this one? Who are you living for? Are you living for yourself? Because that's a really small way to live. Or are you living for God and for others? Because when you choose to do that, it's a really broad, expansive, fulfilling, just grace-filled way to live. Who are you living for? Or how about this one? How are you living? How are you living? Are you considering the consequences that are gonna come for your sinful actions? Because see, God is slow to anger. Okay, and he abounds in love and grace and mercy, but he also loves you and me enough to let us feel the consequences of our sinful actions. And he will, and he does that so that we'll change our hearts. See, if God loves us, and he does, by the way, then he'll use anything and everything to bring us back to him because that is the most important thing to God. And he's gonna do that with or without you. He can do that with you or he can do that in spite of you. 
And he can do that in spite of anything in your life, past or present, that you might think would prevent God from drawing you back to him or anything that you might think would stand between you and God. Maybe you have this desire in your heart, like you just wanna get to God, but there's this thing that seems like it's in the way and you're like, God would want nothing to do with me because of that. And I'm here to tell you, God will not let anything stand between you and him, whether it's with you or in spite of you, because nothing matters to him more than drawing you close and welcoming you back to him. And maybe that's why Acts 2.21 says this, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And by the way, that name is Jesus. We're gonna take a turn into communion here. And, and this is just a time where we remember that fact that God would let nothing stand between you and him. In this next couple of minutes, I just wanna encourage you to ask some of those questions about your life and think about what it looks like. And maybe take this time just to say, God, thanks for loving me so much that even in spite of me, even in spite of the stupid things I do sometimes, the sinful things I do, God, even in spite of my own selfishness or isolation or recklessness, God, thanks for just never turning your back on me. God, thanks for doing everything it took up to and including Jesus dying in my place to reach me. Take a few minutes and just express gratitude to God for that as we take communion together. Let me pray for you. God, I do thank you that you love us so deeply and so much that you are willing to do whatever it took to pull us out of that isolation, to teach us not selfishness, but selflessness. God, I thank you for your grace and your mercy that will always reach out to us no matter uh, how far we walk away or how strongly we resist, no matter how many dumb things we do. God, it is comforting to know that your purpose is gonna be accomplished even in spite of us sometimes. But God, I pray that you would grow this desire in our hearts to be part of what you're doing and to live in cooperation with you. God, let us see how good life can be if we'll just follow your lead. In this moment, we say thank you for your grace. I sent Jesus to the cross in our place to open the door to freedom from the power of sin. And God, I thank you that you're stronger than we are on our own. Teach us to rely on you for that. Pray that in Jesus' name.